Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce three of our students uh, who are in our graduate school. They're going to be doing their presentation, soldiers. And really quickly, because they each only have about 12 minutes, it's kind of tight for time. So our first is uh, Jeff Scott. He did his BSc in biology at the University of Texas, and then worked as a fisheries observer for six years, which is pretty cool. And he's now doing a, a master's with Dr. Mimi Lamb and Dr. Lynn Pitcher here, and he's looking at the values of fishing communities. So please welcome Jeff Scott. So, research here at the Fishery Center can generally be classified as being either descriptive or normative. That is either basic science, such as stock assessments and system modeling, or it can be applied science, uh, such as policy recommendations and conservation science. Now, one issue with normative products is that uh, they rely upon some ethical assumptions that aren't always made explicit. instill these uh, virtues within themselves, prudence, temperance, courage, and justice, in order to be more ethical people. You know, of course, the whole warrior ethic thing is a little bit dated. There have been a number of uh, modern revisions of virtue uh, ethics that make a little bit more sense for our current values and norms. Uh, a couple of millennia after Aristotle, in Immanuel Kant, who offered a a uh, deontological or rule-based system of ethics called uh, the fashion of uh, moral imperative. This is a rule-based system that says that people following certain moral laws or rules uh, will always be moral. There are issues with this, such as uh, what happens when rules contradict each other. Uh, his classic example is what to do if a murderer asks you where he can find his prospective victim. Uh, according to Kant, you would be in the wrong if you lied to protect the victim. That's the virtue of truth trumps everything. This obviously doesn't sit well with common moral uh, sense. An alternative was proposed a little while later by Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. Uh, the idea of utilitarianism is that the ends always justify the means, and that something is good when it produces the greatest good for the greatest number of people. This has been a highly influential theory in the field of economics. However, it also has issues of its own, such as you know, what to define good as, and how to distribute good uh, equitably among a state number of people. And all of these theories ultimately rest upon even deeper assumptions of what moral good is. In the realm of meta-ethics, philosophers wonder if morality is something that we can logically infer through reason, or if it's something that has to come through the gut, what we call intuition. Another uh, idea is whether it derives from a single foundation, whether you call monism, or whether there are multiple sources of foundations. Pluralism. Now, these are all very relevant, uh, relevant questions. However, as a scientist, I'm a little bit more interested in how people actually feel and what values they actually hold, which brings me to a more recent field about uh, descriptive ethics. This is a very highly interdisciplinary field uh, full of philosophers as well as social psychologists and behavioral economists and uh, anthropologists. It's less concerned with what people should do what actual moral values they hold. Uh, my favorite thing to have come out of this uh, field is moral foundations theory. Uh, it has been developed by Jonathan Haidt and Jesse Graham over the last couple of decades. And they attempt to unify all of morality across cultures under five or six universal foundations. Uh, it fall into the foundations of welfare and justice, loyalty or group solidarity, deference to authority, and abhorrence of impurity, what they call this 
say, the Bed Radiation uh, Foundation. Uh, they also posit a potential sixth category of uh, self sovereignty your depression. Now, these can be grouped into more individualistic foundations, where the welfare and justice uh, benefit individuals more than groups. And then the group uh, foundations of loyalty and authority uh, difference and whatnot. Now, the archetypical uh, experiments looking at this have been done in America with political ideology. Here we can see that uh, American self-described extreme liberals tend to value the foundations of welfare and fairness much more highly than they do the foundations of loyalty and voting safety. That is, they value the individual foundations much more. The converse is true for uh, extreme conservatives, in which they hold much more uh, value to the group, towards the uh, group foundations than the liberals. Now, all of this uh, plurality is accepted and tolerated in a liberal society such as Canada's. However, it can lead to some very uh, difficult situations when we're trying to come up with solutions to tough problems. And this is where we have to ask if ethics can offer any sort of practical solution or if it's just a bunch of theory. Uh, one tool that's been developed by practical or applied ethicists is the uh, ethical matrix. This is essentially a framework in which uh, certain principles are elucidated, stakeholders are defined, and then the impacts upon these stakeholders are evaluated for a variety of scenarios in uh, respect to these principles that have already been established. Now, Mimi Lamb, who the Shrek Center, along with a couple of European colleagues, have attempted to uh, apply this ethical matrix and adapt it for the BC herring fishery. Uh, they will hope to use the city workshop of uh, Haida fishermen and resource managers to first identify traditional Haida values and then allow the participants to uh, evaluate the impacts of a variety of management scenarios in respect to the traditional ethics that they hold. What I'm interested in doing is building upon this to look at both the value of herring to uh, the Haida as well as to commercial fishermen and look at how these values influence uh, the different attitudes towards the resource management and whether there's any solution to the uh, current conflict between the First Nations and the commercial industry. The take-home message I'd like to give you from the theoretical ethics is that at the end of the day, we as fisheries experts are nothing more than people that are very uh, knowledgeable about fisheries. We have no moral superiority over anyone else. And at the end of the day, what I feel is most important is that any ethical fisheries management decision is rooted in the values of all stakeholders and not just of the supposed experts. Jeff, one thing that worries me about the, the theory mm -hmm. is that uh, a group like ISIS would score very highly on all those six attributes that you outlined. And there's <laughs> something wrong with that, right? Well, I'm not so sure that they would score highly on the more individualistic ones at all. <laughs> what they would do. And that's another uh, interesting thing. It's, a, it's, very, uh, it's very tempting to treat descriptive ethical theory, such as moral foundations theory, is being normative. But there is no sort of normative... Uh, the people that have proposed moral foundations theory are not saying that these moral foundations should be equally valued. They are saying that different cultures value them differently. It's up to people in society to determine whether certain values are more important than others. And in ISIS's society, they have decided through the rule of law that you know, these group solidarity worlds are much more important than individual welfare or liberty. And I think that ultimately that is something that is not necessary in any case. Uh, I think that's super interesting, just in the sense of, of sort of recognizing that a lot of this stuff is a lot of different values. 
But in the field like, like fishery, which is very much rooted in positive science, it's actually very utilitarian at the outset. How do you reconcile those two? Like how do you, like what if a group wants to fish something out because that's their ethic? But that goes against the rules that we created in the country or by the rest of society. How do you reconcile those two? Well, I, I think that in such a case, um, if no one else speaks up, then if a society at large decides that it's not important enough for them to step in, then I believe that the people that are involved have every ethical right to do what they're doing. I think that it is a decision on the part of people that find resource management valuable and they're going to make themselves be heard and be part of the conversation and argue that their ethics and their standpoints are more uh, legitimate than the others. That's another question. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in how, um, I, I was recently at a workshop with both DFO scientists and DFO managers, and there was kind of this conflict about being able to define an objective that was mutually reasonable because scientists were interested in being sort of objective and, I guess, descriptive, whereas managers have more of a normative perspective. And I'm wondering about kind of your insight into how individuals in the same organization can work together if they're sort of taking like different ethical approaches. I, I think the, the first step that I think is to make explicit that assumptions on it, but too often people talk past each other because these ethical foundations that people have are not recognized in the Recognizing that people from different backgrounds do have different incentives and different uh, values is a good <coughs> starting point. I think it's also important to remember that managers and scientists have interests of their own and that it's not simply beautiful, uh, sort of altruistic uh, debate going on. But, uh, but the making very explicit values versus interests, uh, I think it's the first place to start. Thank you very much, Scott. Hmm. Our next consensus, contestant is Mary Gibson. And, uh, she is currently a master's student with the Fisheries Economics Research Unit. And before that, she uh, got her BSc in Environmental Biology and Ecology at UBC. And then she worked with the Ceramics Project here for a while, specializing in North Sea fisheries. And now she's doing economic valuations of British Columbia fisheries. So please give up for Derek.
majority of the catch going towards human consumption, not production pur purposes. So from these definitions that are commonly used in the literature, you can see that they don't really apply to Canada. It's not too often you see a non-motorized vessel under 12 meters. So part of the challenge to define small-scale fisheries for Canada is that smallness is a relative term. So my methods um, have been created here at UBC and used in the past by Daniel and Shi. And I'm going to group the commercial fisheries based on a target, year, and the length of the vessel, take the landed catch in tons, and rank them, then assign a monetary value, and create a cumulative percentage distribution. And from there, all fisheries falling below 50% of this distribution will be considered small scale. So here's an example figure. This is not my data or the info data of what this would look like. Um, so splitting at 50% and everything below is small scale. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about fisheries in BC for those who are not familiar. So in Canada in 2013, uh, $2.2 billion in landed value were caught. 200, around $250 million of that was from BC. So clearly BC is the smaller fishery. Um, and so these are a few of the commercially important species. We have salmon up here, which if you were to ask basically anybody in the city what is the most important species and most important fishery in Canada or in BC, they would probably say salmon, even though it's not the most economically valuable species. And Dungeness crab is another important species and is often um, paired with salmon, so a lot of people will fish them at different times. And here we have sable fish, which is an interesting fishery because it's quite small and it used to be kind of more of a garbage fish. It wasn't really considered um, edible. <laughs> and recently, or in the last maybe 20, 30 years, has become a really high value species. And um, it's actually interesting because this fish may fall into large scale just because it is a small fishery, but it's such a high value with that distribution that I'm using. A valuable species like this may fall into large when it is in fact small because it's commonly caught with pots and traps, um, as well as some long line. And then on the bottom we have Pacific halibut, which in 2013 represented 17% of the landed value in BC, so very lucrative fishery. So this is um, these are some images from where I'm from, Vladimir, which is just south of Vancouver. And it's historically a farming and fishing village. And now it is not so much a fishing village, but more a farming town. Um, so this photo on the left was taken in the 1980s. And this is actually my grandfather's boat and his brother's boat. And then behind you can see the quality is not great, but <laughs> some smaller vessels, and then maybe a large one there with a big drum. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, these are two images of Vladimir today with larger, uh, more modern vessels. So um, just in my lifetime, my observations, um, Vladimir's gone from a community where kind of everyone knew a fisherman. It's a kind of held the community together. And my grandfather and all his friends were fishermen. My mom worked on his boat in the summers. And that just isn't the case today. Um, I think there's only one girl from my high school that still lives out with their dad, but she's not going to enter the fishery. Um, so there's been a large social shift in that. And we're fortunate enough that we're close to the city. I'm here at the university doing something different. Um, this isn't the case for small communities in BC, like Fort Hardy or Prince Rupert or Kitimat, where um, their community depends on the commercial fisheries. So another point I wanted to make is when I originally looked at these photos, I noticed that today these small vessels are missing. There aren't as many. And originally my thought was there's fewer smaller vessels and more larger, more modern vessels. But when I looked at the DFM data, you can see that there aren't any more larger vessels. In fact, there's fewer. But in the past 30 years, there's been such a major <coughs> in the smaller vessels. So the proportion
proportion of small to large has decreased. So the next steps that I'm going to take are interviewing some fishers in Ladner um, to get their opinions of what they consider small and large and somehow incorporate that into my work. And then I will be choosing a series of indicators such as uh, number of people employed in the fishery, um, ecological damage, fuel consumption, um, and how much of the catch goes towards human consumption versus industrial purposes and then projecting those indicators on short, medium, and long-term scales to see which fisheries and which of these communities that depend on these fisheries will kind of win or lose in the future. And that is all. I'd just like to acknowledge Ocean Canada, Rishidi, and Peru. So any questions or comments? <laughs> I, I really like your project, but I'm totally confused about this idea of putting a 50% line and saying yeah. the half above is large scale and half below is small scale. Like I, um, you know, it seems arbitrary at best and maybe even dangerous at worst. Like why does it need to be a 50-50 split and why is that your criteria? It's just been a method used, so we are exploring different options. This is just what I had. Right. Um, so, um, on the Atlantic coast, they do have a definition of inshore fleet, which is everything below 65 feet. Right. So we may split that way using the Atlantic's kind of definition because there isn't one for the Pacific. Um, yeah, it's something that's still a little bit up in the air. I do agree that it's not the best method, but it is one that has been used. Yeah, I've got a related question. You're, you're uh, ranking, ordering things by, by value of the catch, um, but of course you could rank them by uh, just the gross tonnage of the catch and you get a rather different split, whatever, yeah. whatever the criterion is. Or you could rank them by uh, vessel size, yeah. which is what a lot of countries do. Yeah. So it might be quite interesting to explore those different alternative ways of, of, of ranking yeah. them and coming up with your split point. And that's why I was hoping to do some interviews and kind of incorporate um, what the fishers see as an important right. kind of definition. Because a lot of people have um, ideas about the attributes of small scale fisheries, which yeah. uh, the social science can give you a long list of these, these yeah. things. And I'm going to drive a like having small scale gear and less damaging gear, and well, not always. But, so it would be quite neat to look at which ranking system was most closely aligned with those social science views of small scale yeah. fisheries. In connection with this, um, <coughs> um, FAO doesn't distinguish between uh, large scale and uh, small scale. And uh, uh, Tony Charles and I recently wrote a letter to 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 science suggesting that FAO should do that. Yeah. Now the issue is the editor wanted us to provide a definition for small scale and large scale, and w we pointed out that if we gave such definition, or we really said there should be a definition, then the, the project uh, to separate uh, into large scale and small scale would never happen, because the different countries have different definition. But if the countries using different definition were supplied based on their definition, the split, you would still have the world catch of small scale and large scale, except that uh, the 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 work has to be based on shifting definition. And I wonder, uh, philosophically, if, if this is correct or not. But practically, this the, you cannot have an agreement on, on a definition that would, would be a consensual, worldwide and even nationally. You cannot have it. So they, they must be like models, eh? like any model, they must be used for the practicality and the, the practicality of your definition of it's one that this paper was uh, produced. Uh, I'm a co author, I think, yeah. of it. Uh, the first. The, we explored that uh, in 2000. And, and we, I concluded for my part that I would not follow up on it. Because when we say 50%, when we use for volume or, or value, we end up always having 50%. Mm -hmm. 
or small scale and large scale. So you cannot actually uh, uh, represent the, the changing relationship over time because you always have 50 percent. So that that's, uh, is a principal argument that that would work against that definition. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big discussion about the threat. I mean, you could you could be have more threshold. You could have the quartile. So you could say upper lower quartile, upper would definitely be large scale, lower quartile definitely small scale, and then in the middle is some middle stuff that doesn't. Yeah, there's talk about you about could do all sorts of things like that. These medium scale fisheries, but I mean, it's not that clear using this vessel data. Interesting discussion. <laughs> One more question for Dara. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just wondering what the value for perhaps policy and, and management in DC of having that definition would be, like having that hard class definition, whether it's for DC or for the nation. Yeah, I think it would be useful. I mean, they use the definition on the Atlantic. They put a lot of focus on these new short, smaller vessels um, as a way of, I think they have to be owner operators or something like that. So it's a way of the value of the fishery better on the Atlantic coast, and that's not in place here, so I'm hoping that maybe we can find a way to incorporate this. That's it. Okay, last but not least, got Robbie here with us. Ravi did his uh, BSc at the University of the West Indies in Marine Biology, and then completed a professional master's at the University of Miami in fishery science. And he is now in the second year of his PhD, uh, working on coral reef uh, fisheries management. Yeah. So let's give it a big hand. Exciting to be here. Thanks for coming up, guys. Uh, so, as we were saying, I'm working on coral reef fisheries. So coral reefs are very much considered to be rainforests of the ocean and that's owing to their incredible structural complexity uh, that hosts a wide, type, well, like a, a diverse species assemblage of uh, many marine organisms. Unfortunately, coral reefs have been undergoing significant declines over the past few decades in the Great Barrier Reef. 50% um, decline in coral cover was observed between the period of uh, 1985 to 2012. And uh, the Caribbean, even worse off, approximately 80% decline between 1977 and 2002. What that looks like, kind of like this. See, uh, in 1975, this is a picture of the discovery of the engine. You can see these massive Acropora, beautiful Acropora beds, black and white. But when you see these in color, they're really nice. And that's same exact picture, same exact reef in 2013, completely decimated. This is a Carrie's Fort Reef in the Florida Keys. You can see it's a similar keys with the Palmata beds up there. So massive declines in coral cover. And this is primarily because of a number of external stresses that have been acting on these ecosystems for quite some time. Uh, primarily human impacts and climate impacts. So human impacts have been acting on these systems for a very long time overfishing and coastal intervention, uh, there's some broad categories of these impacts. Ben Halpern uh, and his uh, uh, co-researchers, they produced the global uh, map of human impacts on marine ecosystems and coral reefs, ranked as one of the highest impacted, despite their small spatial footprint. Climate impacts, uh, these days we're seeing the impact of coral bleaching, it's quite significant. There were the global bleaching events of 1998 and then 2005. And uh, the future impacts of acidification and sea level rise that are supposed to threaten the reefs well into the future. And so the importance of this, uh, coral reefs are ecologically important, uh, primarily well, in the context of fisheries. Uh, they, they're part of a coastal seascape, uh, this mangrove seagrass, coral reef complex that is important for ontogenic migrations of important, commercially important reef species. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so the mangroves provide important juvenile habitat and as these fish species mature, they slowly migrate offshore through seagrass beds and then finally onto the reef system. And this has importance for society because 
uh, well, if you look at this map, uh, well, this map shows uh, the association between coral reef systems in red and um, countries with low, well, 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 countries ranked by their GDP. I and mean, you, you, you can see most of these uh, coral reef systems associated with countries that have quite low GDP, those are the shaded countries. Many of these countries rely on coral reef systems for numerous ecosystem services, um, either for nutrition or um, they rely on income from tourism or fresh fish exports. So uh, potential for the societal impacts into the future. Now these declines have been occurring despite management regimes that have been on these reefs for, 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 for quite some time. Uh, and uh, Bellwood describes, well defines coral reef ma management as quite a mouthful. I kind of um, refine, well, not to refine, but to summarize some of the key points that um, that they should consider social and ecological goals. And some of the greatest criticisms of many management regimes or corporations is that they don't necessarily, well, especially at the is that they don't necessarily consider some of these greater um, goals and these objectives, these paradigms. And the significant gaps regarding these particular paradigms. I'm really interested in those ecological gaps, so this is what I'm going to get into now. Uh, this, like I said, um, this coral reef ecosystem, uh, it's impacted by multiple stresses, but these stresses, they don't act individually, they act in concert with each other, so they can act, um, uh, they can have multiplicative effects, they can have additive effects, so it, it's a very complex, how should I say, mishmash of um, stresses that are acting on these ecosystems, and it's important to understand that, because uh, these systems are quite complex, as I pointed out earlier, the numerous pathways through which these stresses can influence flows, like energetic flows, through the ecosystem and as a result have impacts such as regime shifts, trophic cascades, and they're quite unpredictable. They, you know, they're hard to yeah, they're hard to predict if you don't truly understand like, the line of ecological impacts. So how do managers deal with this? How do researchers deal with this? Um, while there's an extensive literature on these external stressors on numerous ecosystem components. Um, it's you know many of these stressors are very uh, situational and they have a, a unique spatial context. So how do you distill these stressors into the most relevant ones for this new particular case that you study? Well, many authors have been looking at ecosystem resilience as a framework to sort of uh, hold together the most important stressors and ecosystem components for particular unique spatial contexts. And resilience, once again, another mouthful, uh, defined by Hughes is the capacity of an ecosystem to absorb recurrent disturbances uh, without switching to alternative stable states. Um, and this is important because uh, each ecosystem, like I said, is impacted by its particular stressor. And, and, and if you, sorry, yeah, and, 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 and has particular cornerstones of resilience as defined by the nice strong. And these cornerstones of resilience, um, yeah, these cornerstones of resilience, if you put this together with the idea of, uh, sorry, I just need to kind of gather myself. Uh, yeah, so, so these, but, but these two definitions, these two things are very important to my research because they sort of drive the way in which I'm hoping to operationalize this sort of disparate idea of resilience because there are many, well, there are a number of resilience frameworks that are, that are utilized in the literature to, to bring these different stresses together. And um, I'm hoping to, to sort of utilize a couple of them or maybe one of them to, to work on a couple of systems in the Caribbean. So, focusing on my research, I'm really hoping to find some indicators of coral reef resilience that are simple enough to utilize for management, they're not too complex. You know, um, they utilize readily available metadata that can be compiled quite easily without a ton of specialized technical um, uh, know-how. And so, my first step is to define my framework, uh, my resilience framework. And Within this, I have three particular questions that I would like to identify what the cornerstones of resilience in these Caribbean reef ecosystems are. 
um, what particle external forces are important to these breathing ecosystems, and how to com compartmentalize and quantify these interactions. Secondly, I would like to make some projections into the future to try and understand how these interactions will change in the future under a changing global ecosystem and sort of climate change and changing human impacts and um, what implications there are for society and governance. So, how I plan, well, yeah, I'll get into how I plan to approach it, but let me speak a little bit about my, my current week. Uh, so, I've been, been involved in quite a bit of framework building. I've been looking for important cornerstones of resilience and I've identified a couple right now I'm working with um, looking at community dynamics of fish and coral species, but primarily fish species right now. I've uh, been looking at ocean warming as a primary stressor on these on, on, on fish dynamics. And um, I'm looking at a, a, a comp compartmentalize and quantify these, these these dynamics. I'm looking at functional groups, which are these general um, general classifications of species that perform similar ecological roles within an ecosystem. Um, and aspects of that I that to quantify, well, used to quantify these groups, species richness and response diversity. Response diversity just refers to the, how should I say, the, uh, if I should just report myself, the diversity of responses that different species show to external stressors uh, on these functional groups. The more diverse the response, the more resilient your function. Right now, I'm working with uh, an indicator that I, that William Leon told my supervisor. Um, it's it's a mean temperature of the catch. And what it is, it it gives an indication of how species the well, how species composition changes under yeah yeah changes under um, under global warming. And it's given by the average weight of female optimum uh, for all species in the cash report. Now, we're going to do this on a global scale, and I'm hoping to take it and, and, and bring it down to uh, regional and uh, national scale. Uh, my regional analysis is um, currently shifted to, 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 well, to this particular ultras, in which I have. Um, mean temperature to catch the original average and sea surface temperature. You can see that the mean temper temperature to catch is, it, it shows, it follows a certain increasing trend to sea surface temperature, which is what we expect as, you know, um, species that are not thermally adapted to increasing global temperatures will be excluded from the catch. So I'm going to break this down to a book into EEZs and hopefully functional groups to try and get a better idea of how this might be affecting species, well, re species in particular. Uh, possible future work, and it's a bit of a mess, but uh, under the cornerstones, I'm looking to explore fish community that dynamics a bit more with EW, with Robert and Ecosystem. I'm hoping to, well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see how we can apply Williams' uh, dynamic bioclimates a good model to understand how coral cover, coral species biogeography will change into the future. With respect to external drivers, I'm looking at uh, a single to noise ratio an analysis that looks at synchrony uh, between various external drivers. And with respect to significance, I'm hoping to, to again, incorporate some bioeconomic analysis and uh, some policy analysis as well. Uh, that concludes my talk. I'd uh, like to acknowledge my community members, my mates, and the rest of the Fishery Center. Thank you very much. Thanks. Questions? If, if there are no questions, I would like to make a point about the tree presentation. Uh, all three that are presented here are graduates of the Fish 500, right? And you have noticed that they use black and white letters <laughs> that you can read. Um, not too much stuff on each slide, and so on. Um, there was one, only one typo in the, in the three things. It would be Sony, a uh, symbol that should have been capitalized. <laughs> so, you missed one there. Huh? You missed one type. I missed one. These are no? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so we should eradicate the typos, but 
we should, we should, we should, uh, because I have not seen them. This is the reason. But we, we should, um, uh, we should work toward having, making presentation that people can see, and people can don't fight with reading and stuff. And there is no attempt here to to have background and all kinds of stuff. But you can read it. That so. Um, the fish 500, that's what they learn. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that. Uh, uh, yes. that uh, it's not by accident that these three things are very similar. Um, yeah. I have a question for, for Ron. <coughs> um, really good appreciation. I, I found like the image of the very powerful. We have like, the human impacts, the fish and all this stuff, mm -hmm. and the climate impact. Right, so especially in coral reefs, and I guess in the Caribbean in particular, um, the two are working at the same time, at different scales, on the same thing. So, like, moving forward, like, aside from the model, like, what's the model that's done, I'm assuming you'll eventually try and go to management or something like that. Like, how do you combat those two things? Like, some things that you can change, and others that you probably won't be able to. Well, it's, it's quite interesting because, um, uh, I've, some of the literature that I've read has, has tried to address this problem. And in fact, uh, one of the papers I've read uh, talked about this uh, global disparity uh, in benefits uh, to coral reefs <coughs> and, uh, uh, from like, reducing global emissions. And actually, uh, Caribbean coral reefs would seem to benefit a lot less. And, 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 and a lot of these authors seem to recommend that instead of thinking about how we could reduce global emissions for the sake of coral reefs. By all means, um, reduce global emissions, but to manage Caribbean coral reefs in particular, uh, we should focus on local drivers, you know, so um, human impacts, like overfishing, coastal development, just things like that that are more local, that have more of a direct impact on the ecosystem as opposed to marketing. So, yeah, so prioritization of those. Just on the same line, um, so you're saying that you're going to plan to use um, fish community structure mm -hmm. in, and clean temperature cap. But then, uh, in a short time frame, isn't fish community structure going to be more impacted by fishing mm -hmm. and overfishing than uh, climate change? And so, then how are you going to account for that? Or is that something you're taking into consideration in one? Oh, no, that's. That is at least something I would like to consider as well. But well, well, that I have to consider as well to go fishing is, is going to be part of that. Uh, and I guess that's where I'm going to bring in some of these simulations with people back and you just But uh, I haven't you got to that stage yet. The data exists for me to what make that happen and to look at different policy options and how they might you know, influence fish community structure. Because uh, one thing I'm realizing, like a well, you know, fish community structure and, 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 and composition of species that exist in the economy, the assemblages, they have an impact on the, res on the overall resilience of the ecosystem. So if you manage for those functional groups that actually can contribute to the resilience, so then, you know, have a whole world. So you could just go, in a sense, here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, please join me in giving all three of your hands.